Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yannep General, and today we are taking a look at one of the old original stories written for Total War Warhammer, and this one is called The Son of Kislev. If you enjoyed this video, do consider joining or subscribing, or even just dropping a like. Any little bit helps the channel. Got some exclusive content for our members already in the member section, including parts four and five of our ongoing Malice series, if you want to check that out. And we are revisiting the old retro game Shadow of the Horned Rat. But other than that, please sit back and enjoy. Underneath the inn, a fell ritual was taking place. Six elvish figures danced and wove about the patrons. The cellar was crowded with revelers who roared in unshackled ecstasy. A group of six cossars began dancing, a mix of high and low kicks, as was the tradition in southern Kislev. The elves swooped in, weaving in around the dancers to mesmerizing effect. The crowd cheered, louder and louder, all while clapping to the beat of the stamping cossars. I see heresy. The voice, louder even than the crowd, reverberated across the cellar, every syllable laden with judgment. The dancing stopped. Suddenly there was silence. All looked up to the top of the cellar steps. There stood Costaltin, the supreme patriarch of Urson's cult and leader of the great orthodoxy. All here are sinners. All here shall burn. The elves hissed, their eyes now pools of black. They sprung up the steps at twice the speed of their previous whirling dance moves. The first one to reach Castaltin no longer had a hand, but an elongated claw-like blade that extended from the elbow. Costaltin looked on unfazed. He swung a heavy mace that blocked the elf's swing. As the two weapons connected, the brazier on the mace's head burst into flame. The elf seemed blinded by this, and so did not see the patriarch's headbutt that crushed into its face. He spat at the creature as it tumbled off the stairs and into the former revelers. The five other elves were also dazed by the holy brazier's combustion, but were quickly recovering. The supreme patriarch, however, merely turned around and left. A heavy oak door closed firmly behind him, and all light in the cellar went out. Castalton strode from the cellar with purpose through the inn's taproom towards the exit. Patrons and innkeepers looked on uneasily as armed patriarchs remained at the doors that led onto Kislev's streets. What do you bid, High Patriarch? said one that carried the rank of Orthodoxy Superior. Castalton's face gave nothing as he spoke. He walked outside, expecting his subordinate to keep up. Urson has forsaken this gospoda. Burn it to the ground. The flock must be protected. No one leaves. The Patriarch Superior gave a nod to the gathered brother Patriarchs, who swarmed toward the inn with torches lit. And the Tsarina, said the subordinate, what of her? She'll not take kindly to an immolation in the shadow of the Bokar Palace. The Ice Court claims the capital not take kindly, spat the Supreme Patriarch. He had stopped in the middle of the street, oblivious to any traffic, and turned his ire upon the underling. No longer impassive, the fires of his fury were now truly lit. This child, a witch no less, sits upon the throne. All too eager to rest her frozen buttocks upon the seat still warm from her father's touch. Urson bless his revered spirit. Yet the ruinous powers send their agents to cavort in spitting distance of where she eats and fornicates. No, it is I that does not take kindly to all this. She'd already be screaming on a pyre if she did not share the Red Tsar's blood. Behind him, licks of flame came through the windows of the inn. Faint screams could be heard. Magic is evil, even if you cloak it in ice. That is why the Great Bear is silent. He despises this witch who claims sovereignty upon the motherland. The subordinate carefully removed the phlegm from his face, avoiding eye contact with his master. 
He shuffled uncomfortably. Brother Uzketh, something bothers you. Speak. Fornication? If we are to bring the Druzina to our cause, we must be careful not to make frivolous accusations. Uzkev tailed off under the withering stare of Kastaltin. Only a few in the Great Orthodoxy would dare raise such a point to the Supreme Patriarch directly, and unfortunately for Uzkev, he was one of them. Kastaltin suddenly burst into laughter. Brother Uzkev, if I did not know better, I think you'd be calling me a liar. I make no false pronunciations. He took a parchment from his belt and plunged it into Uzkev's chest, who staggered at the force. Uzkev shakingly unfolded the parchment and read the words on it. From my spy in the palace, added Kastaltin. Brother Uzkev looked at his master. Who is Prince Yuri Barkov? Exactly, said the Supreme Patriarch, who was on the move once more. Come, brother, come to the Grand Citadel. We have work to do. Behind them, the building was fully aflame. Kislevites rushed towards it with buckets of ice and snow, only to be stopped by a ring of great orthodoxy soldiers and patriarchs. The inn would burn all night until there was nothing but blackened timber and ash. The road to the city of Kislev was crowded with the poor and frozen. Progress to the capital was slow. Out of the way, move! Garrick rode at the head of the twenty-strong mounted column of hardened Cossars, trying to force the refugees to the side of the road. He turned and rode back to his brother, who was ambling along in the center of his retinue. It's no good. The roads are choked with peasants. We're going to be late, said an exasperated Garrick. Then we'll be late. There is no point adding to the misery of these common folk by pushing them aside. They already suffer said Yuri. I know, brother. Six years of constant winter, but we cannot keep the Tsarina waiting. It'll be considered bad form to miss an appointment with the Ice Queen, and you know what they're like down here. Any excuse to mock Ungol blood? Ice Queen? Yes. That's what they're calling her in all the gospodars and taverns. It has a poetic weight, does it not? Hmm, smiled Yuri. She'll always be cat to me. A lot has happened since then. She's now queen, and you're now a prince. Stop reminding me, Garrick. You know I don't like that term. Just some empire anachronism from when Magnus was awarding our ancestors titles in the aftermath of Prague's retaking. It means very little these days, especially down here. Nonsense, countered Garrick. You are a Druzina, foremost of the Kavalenko and Barkov families, and so a prince over many of the Ungol tribes. You know how these Gospodars like to lord their titles over us, but yours actually comes with rank in Mother Kislev's courts. From up ahead, a horn accompanied by an unmistakable rhythm of galloping hooves. Ah... The Griffin Legion, said Garrick, sent by the Tsarina to get us into the city on time, no doubt. See, your titles do matter, brother. So much for keeping this little visit quiet, murmured Yuri. He turned to his brother with a thoughtful look. You know what bothers me about this endless winter? That our fathers can't go crops? That we're importing all our food from the Empire and prices are rising? No. If Father Bear won't roar in the spring... Why can't we give Daz a nudge to warm up the motherland instead? After all, he is the god of the sun. That's a question better asked of the patriarchs, brother, Garrick retorted. Hmm, I don't think I will, laughed Yuri, who eased his own steed into a run toward the approaching legion. Garrick followed and broke into song. The Ungol riders with them joined in. Yuri and Garrick were escorted into the city and shown to their rooms to rest for the evening. They would address the court in the morning. Death is like the winter chill. No door can keep it from us, and summer yet may bloom again, though ice be all upon us. The sun it freezes then shatters, a young man with golden locks and burning eyes, he closes them. Shaking his head, he walks into the dark. You are no prince, unworthy, 
Kovalenko blood in your veins. Do not seek what is lost. Another emerges, an older man, large and muscled. He wears only a loincloth, grey in his beard. Chains shoot from the darkness, black chains. They fetter the man, bringing him to his knees. The dark roils around him like a fog. Find me, son of Kislev. Yuri woke with a start. His chamber door rattled as Garrick banged upon it from the other side. Get dressed, brother. We are late for court. The Boca Palace lies at the center of the capital, a great edifice of towers and citadels projecting the power of the Tsardom. And at its heart was the Ice Court. The name was not a frivolous one, for it was made of ice. Stone walls and pillars could be seen deep within the ice, but it was elevated and built upon by the twisting fractals of frost created by the Tsarina's magic. No wonder they call her the Ice Queen, Fort Yuri, as he stared down from the galleries at the central dais, where upon the throne sat the Sovereign of Kislev. She looked beautiful and stern in her raiment of office, mused Yuri. A far cry from the smiles and jests he used to share with her. He had tried to catch her gaze, but she had studiously ignored him. Throughout the day, the business of the court took place. Most of it was unengaging and dealing with Kislev's plight. This was a nation used to harsh long winters, all while defending against the threat from the north. Yet even the hardiest of Kislevites on the Oblast were struggling with a deep frost that would not end. The roar of spring, usually taking the form of a great loud storm, would signal the end of the snowfall and the beginning of the rains, followed by the sun, and for a few short months, spring, then a tepid summer, when crops would grow and animals fattened. But that was six years past, coming on for the seventh. Yuri's reverie was broken as a serf approached, summoning him down from the gallery to be formally introduced to the Tsarina. He approached the throne flanked by Garrick and another of his loyal uncles. She sat regal on the throne, surrounded by her own royal retinue. Ice guard with glowing frost-bladed glaives stood closest on either side of the throne, while the richly attired and armed Tsar guard prowled the outer edges of the court. For the first time in years, Katrina looked directly at him, and Yuri saw no warmth in those eyes, just the icy cold. They bowed deeply as the royal seneschal announced their approach. Muttering could be heard around the court. It seemed the rumor smiths had already heard about their past. And why does an Ungol prince journey to the capital, said the Tsarina in a voice as cold as her gaze. Confusion swept across Yuri's face before he hid it under the typical dour aspect of a Kislevite warrior. She had summoned him. He knew challenging her on that point would not serve either of them, as the audience strained to hear, and so responded in a neutral fashion about concern for his tribesmen as the winter, especially this winter, was even harsher in the north. The Tsarina nodded, and Yuri felt an ice-cold pang on the back of his hand, crawling up his wrist and forearm. He wondered if he was having some kind of stroke or spasm, but refused to show weakness in front of so many gospodars in the court. Before he could linger, the Seneschal skillfully herded Yuri's retinue away from the throne and back towards the grand door they had entered by. That very door flung open and the supreme patriarch of Ursan's cult strode through. Patriarch superior of each of the Kislevite faiths followed in his wake. The Great Orthodoxy in full panoply. The two groups moved past each other. Kostaltin momentarily glared at Yuri before they reached the door. Yuri stopped and turned, despite court etiquette, dictating they return to the galleries above. Come, we're better off far from this, whispered Garrick. No, I need to hear it, said Yuri in a low tone. Besides, no one's looking at us anymore. He was right. The attention of the court was firmly on Castalton. His holy retinue arrived before the throne. The patriarch superior bowed to the Tsarina. Castalton remained ramrod straight. High patriarch, said the queen. Yuri thought she had been called to him, but her voice had been positively welcoming compared to the contempt barely concealed in those two words. You dare summon me, child? The correct form of address is your highness, 
stated the Seneschal, who to his credit remained firm under Constalton's withering glare. You burnt down an inn full of my subjects, just half a mile from here. I want to know why, said the Tsarina. I answer only to the gods. I certainly don't need to justify my actions to a witch. The ice guard went from attentive to an aggressive pose in a swift motion. They would brook no insult to their liege. The Tsarina bade them return to their previous stance. But you do have to answer to the sovereign, the founder of your orthodoxy. Boris Ursus is dead. Yes, he is, shouted the Ice Queen, unbeknownst to anyone. She touched a forefinger to her thumb, and small shards of ice grew across the frozen structures of the ice court. But I am his daughter. He was Tsar, so I am Tsarina. As her voice rose, the shards vibrated, making it louder and sharper. You answer to me, Patriarch, as does every Kislevite. Those in the galleries muttered, as if collectively recovering from an onslaught. Kostaltin remained resolute, but the Patriarchs behind him gathered and conversed. One approached their leader, and they spoke briefly. Kostaltin turned back to the throne, annoyance upon his brow. I observe the sacraments for this moment. The Gospodar you inquire about was a haven for demons, and so was purged, along with all the lost souls within. Then his anger returned. The ruinous powers cavort at your doorstep. They are attracted to magic, like moths to a flame. You may rule for now, but the last great Bokar was your father. If the monarchy is in the clutches of magic users and witches, then perhaps it is time for a change. The people's only salvation from chaos is the church. Kostaltin didn't wait to be dismissed, but spun about and walked away from the throne, his patriarchs in tow. Say the word, my Zarina, whispered the nice guard next to her. He'll be dead before he leaves the chamber. No hissed Catherine. It would start a war that could only serve the dark powers. The moth wouldn't just be drawn to the flame. It would burn and spread its fire everywhere. Just outside the icy vestibule, Yuri was about to study his sore forearm when Castalton burst forth from the throne room. He homed in on Yuri. Garrick tried to intercept, but the Supreme Patriarch pushed him aside. Tell me, Prince Yuri. Prince. Does that foreign title not disgust you? Yuri did not respond, but held his gaze even as Castalton's face got close to his. Tell me, you claim lands in Duckless Forest. My brethren sweep those trees looking for the hags, practicing their heathen rites, but they remain elusive. One thing they do tell me is that Mother Ostankia and her shadow creatures are no mere myth. The common folk... We'll always swear that the legend is real, said Yuri. I don't think so. Not this time. Too many witness statements given under certain amounts of duress claim she exists and so presents a threat to this nation. The stories, my dear patriarch, say she is a protector of the motherland. Only those that wish the land harm need fear her. She is a witch and a powerful one at that. If we find any of your ungols are withholding the crone's location, then I will declare the whole tribe apostate. Yuri wiped the phlegm from his face, but Kostaltin had already moved off without looking back. You're making lots of friends down here, said Garrick. Let's get back to our chambers. I need to check my arm. Back in his room at the far end of the palace, a wing not coated in permafrost, Yuri pulled up his right sleeve to reveal a thin layer of ice running from his wrist up the forearm to the elbow. The ice gleamed as he shrugged off the fact it hadn't melted yet. This had better not be permanent, he muttered to himself. On closer inspection, he saw words etched into it, a location and time. Suddenly, the ice began to melt away. He clenched and unclenched his hand while calling for Stefan, a loyal Cossar stationed outside his door. Yes, Boyarin, get my brother. We have to go out.
The winter gardens were part of the palace compound, and yet, other than the towers of ice and the onion domes that dominated the skyline, you could be forgiven for thinking you were in a far more remote place rather than the capital. The garden was well tended with trimmed hedges, high flower beds containing species both local and exotic. The paths were lined with great pines and samples of tall grasses from across the motherland. Most important of all, a great cave stood atop a mound in its center. The cave walls were inscribed with images and prayers to the father bear, and a large altar itself, carved into the shape of a large bear wearing a golden crown, was erected before the cave mouth. A shrine to Urson, second only to the great bear's temple as the holy site in the city. Everywhere was capped or covered in snow, as it had been for the past few years. Midnight had gone, and it was dark. Even the moon was hidden behind the clouds. Other than Yuri's cossars, the garden seemed deserted. The brothers walked anxiously along the length of the altar, trying to keep themselves and their retinue inconspicuous. Why would she want to meet here, now? asked Garrick. Why not in her private chambers? It's her palace. Because there are spies everywhere, said the Ice Queen. She appeared from within the cave mouth and stepped forward to greet Yuri, holding out her hands, a smile on her face. No longer a stern regent, this was the girl, the woman he remembered. Cat, I have missed you, and I you, my prince. They embraced. Why these clandestine methods? You are the Tsarina, said Yuri as he stepped back to look into her eyes. My rule is not as stable as my father's. The orthodoxy, the ruinous powers all work to unseat me. But that is a minor concern. My subjects struggle. The endless winter weakens us, and so the forces of chaos prey upon them. When day breaks, I take the armies of the Ice Court North, for the Blood God's host invades through Black Blood Pass. Then we shall go with you. No, I have a greater task. It may be too much, even for you. Name it, Cat. Your Highness. The Lost God must be found. Only Urson can melt the snows of this cursed winter. I agree, but I am only a mortal man. How can I search for a god? Fort Dervingard, our furthest northern outpost established by my father decades past as a beacon in the northern wastes, a haven amongst the madness. Its commander, Boyar Slavin Kearns, a loyal Boyarin, has sent me messages claiming he has heard Urson's roar, that the great bear prowls those far lands. Then I shall go there. I can leave on the morrow with you, accompanying your army, fight with you against the demons, and then continue north. Catherine shook her head. No, brave Yuri. I need you to return home. Gather supplies. Prepare your warriors and await my missive. She held his gaze. We must coordinate, for I will not let them use our bond as a weapon against us. They already know of our past. If we are seen together, they will wield your heritage to claim that I shall weaken the Boca line. Who? said Yuri furiously. Who would do such a thing? I would. Standing on top of the cave stood the supreme patriarch, surrounded by the grand citadel guards. Fornicators! You dare desecrate this shrine with your lust! I see your spies have done their job, spat Catalin. I have no need for spies when your uncle paramour told me all I needed to know. For a moment, the Tsarina looked back at Yuri, with a flash of betrayal in her eyes. Liar! shouted Yuri. I never lie. As I have said, she is a child, passing notes to you like some lovesick student in a classroom. Getting close to you is easy, Prince Yuri. As we exchanged views on the hags infesting your land, I read your messages as it sat in ice upon your arm. Not with my eyes, but the most holy of senses, touch. He held out his hand. You are unaware, of course. The one good thing about ice, it numbs the skin. That was my confession. Now it is time for yours 
time to admit that Kislev needs to be led by the faithful. Give me stewardship, and I may yet let you live. You are the Red Tsar's daughter, after all. You will never hold the throne, shouted the Ice Queen. I don't want to hold the throne. I want to destroy it. The Citadel guards charged down the slopes of the cave while he leaped to the ground, his mace burning. Kislev will be saved, not by birthright, but by faith. He struck out at the closest body, an Ungol Corsar, who barely managed to parry. Yuri and Garrick drew their swords and engaged the orthodoxy forces, while the Tsarina rose above them all on a pillar of ice. Attend us, she shouted, and from the undergrowth a full rotar of ice guard emerged and loosed their frost shard arrows into the air that rained down upon the citadel guards. You have gone too far, priest. This is treason. It is you who betrayed a nation, shouted Kostaltin, as he struck down one of the Ungols before engaging another. He swiped with his burning mace and connected with the head of Stefan. The Kassar fell dead upon Urson's altar, blood seeping from his wound. There was a low rumble. The ground heaved, and suddenly the altar cracked apart, revealing a rent in the material realm. Growls could be heard, and then hellish canines sprang from the opening, attacking any mortal that was close. Yuri and Garrick stopped fighting their opponents, and both they and the Citadel guards immediately turned to face the flesh hounds of corn as the pack raced towards them, jaws gnashing. Demons, hear, Garrett gasped, as he stabbed his sword into the eye of a flesh hound that simply shrugged off what would have been a fatal blow on any mortal creature. And suddenly his sword began to glow. A light frost gleamed across the blade, on Yuri's too, and all the Kislevites present. Your blades are blessed! Now vanquish these interlopers! commanded the Ice Queen. Yuri and his brother Ungols fought with renewed fury. This spurred on the Citadel guards and the Ice warriors of the Tsarina. By the altar, Kostaltin faltered. He looked upon the bloody body of Stefan. What have I done? You gave the enemy what it needed. You gave the blood god a bloody sacrifice upon the bear's altar. The ingress required to stop me from facing his host in the days to come, said the queen from upon high. She stood on the ice pillar and sent shards of frost raining down on the flesh hound pack. No! No! No, I am no puppet! I am no tool of the Dark Gods! Castaltin's mace had been a spluttering flame, but it suddenly turned into a ball of bright hot fire as the realization hit. He strode into the demon hounds, casting one down with each swing. It was the impetus the Kislevites needed. They surrounded the demon pack and fought with wrathful vigor, for in their blood was generations of fighting against the forces of chaos. They were the bulwark against the darkness. Yuri's sword arm spun, and he slayed another flesh hound. It burned from existence. He noticed that there were but a few hounds left, the creatures smoldering and turned to ash before they could be struck. The rent in the world withered, leaving only the bodies of the mortals slain. Six of Yuri's men and a few of the Ice Guard. The Citadel Guards had fared the worst, but a few still survived. They gathered around the broken altar and took stock. I should have you clapped in chains and hung for treason, said the Tsarina to the Supreme Patriarch. Then why don't you? Defiance returned to Kostaltin's voice. You know why. Your followers would be at the palace gates, a martyr in mere moments, and then the schism would fester. We would be doing the Dark God's work once more. There may be some truth in what you say. As I never lie, I cannot deny your foul magics have aided us to vanquish these abominations. I must ruminate on these events. I take my penance away from this palace of iniquity, this city of heathens. Yes, go. You are exiled from here, said the Ice Queen. Castaltin stood defiant and then saw the Ice Guard and Ungols outnumbered what was left of his followers. Fine, witch! I'll take my leave, but salt the soil of this garden. It is desecrated. I will go to the true shrine of Urson on the coast. The Patriarch left along with his remaining followers. Escort them. 
ordered the Tsarina to her ice guard. She looked at Yuri and Garrick. Come, brother Ungols, said Garrick. We must celebrate our victory of Kvass and Vodka. Cheers erupted from the Ungols. We will let them talk in peace. Then we will return to claim our dead. They left, and so Yuri was alone at last with Katerina. I can accompany you now. Kostaltin will not cause any more trouble after this. He gestured to the broken altar. Oh, brave Yuri. No, he is a wounded animal, more dangerous than ever. You must follow my plan. Return to your homeland. Prepare and await my order. Yuri nodded, and they came in close, their foreheads touching. What if I am not strong enough? Not worthy enough to find the great bear? Why not send the golden knight, so I might fight at your side? Nariska petitions our cause in the Empire. No, you are my prince, a worthy one at that. If I am Kislev's daughter, then you are Kislev's son. One thing you can learn from that fanatic. Let faith power you. Let it be your armor and your strength. Then our god will find you. Let us return to the palace. We both must be ready to leave in the morning. The Ungol prince and the ice queen left the garden and went their separate ways. They would never see each other again. And so Yuri marched forth in a bid to find the great bear god so he can roar and usher in a long-awaited spring. He would face many trials and tribulations before his journey's end. The Tsarina marched north and fought a war against the blood god's army, whilst Kostaltin plotted and pondered. He would go on to find the truth and uncover a great asset in the war against the dark. And that is the end of the tale of the son of Kislev. The prologue of Total War Warhammer 3 obviously picks up the tale of Yuri, and the Kislev campaign obviously kicks off the tale of either Kostaltin or the Tsarina. I usually sort of end these videos by, especially if they're about legendary lords, looking at how they played on the tabletop. But I thought I'd take a section just give you guys my thoughts on this story. It's not my favorite, but it does introduce a lot of the characters and where they're coming from. I think my biggest problem with this story is not the Yuri, which is new lore that Yuri and, and Catherine were these kind of childhood friends gone on to become lovers before she took over the throne, before her father died or disappeared. And that's a fun little aspect. It gives them a personal touch. It ties the prologue closer to Tsarina and what's going on there. And there should really be some sort of payoff that I don't think is in the game when they eventually face off against each other, the God Slayer and the Tsarina in the campaign map. I think that's um, maybe a missed opportunity there for a little cinematic, especially when it was a lot more um, focused on the narrative when they first launched Total War Warhammer 3. But I have huge problems with the character of Kostaltin in this story. Now, they made huge amounts of changes to the Church of Urson for Total War Warhammer 3, but he has committed treason. He insults the Queen openly. Like, this idea that everyone, he's so well followed. He's not nice to anyone. He emulates people. Like, yeah, the faith of Urson is strong, but I just feel like the people, like, know, they don't fear ice magic particularly. It's not a superstition. The Tsarina who fought with Magnus the Pious was an ice-wielding user as well. Like, they've had female rulers in the past, very famous ones, if not their most famous ones. So this idea that the population would back him just because he runs the Church of Urson seems a little bit far-fetched. And the fact that she would keep him around even after they made peace, seems even more crazy. Especially if you take the idea of the Red Tsar re-emerging, which can happen in the campaign of Total War Warhammer 3. If he re-emerges, he has one meeting with his daughter, they're killing Kostaltin. Like, they'll just chop his head off for treason. They'll be like, I'm back to the head of the Church of Urson. You're a horrible traitor who tried to dethrone my daughter. You're dead. So the fact that sort of Kostaltin goes on to find the Red Tsar. It's like, yeah, I found him. He'd be like, oh god, I should probably keep him on ice because he'll kill me if he wakes up because of all the stuff I did to his kid. I tried to take over the country, for God's sake. There's not going to be going to be glad handing. There needs to be sort of a fallout from this. Um, and that's what this sets up that I, is my pro was my problem with this story. He goes too far. Like, if he was doing this work through, like, proxies and some of his priests were perhaps overdoing it. That's the way I would have approached it. Some of his priests are being overzealous, 
And behind the scenes, he's the one pushing them forwards to burn down inns and have the audacity to call Zarina a traitor, but she executes them, but he would never say it out loud to her. And then her killing all these insulting and treasonous priests is what's building up the population against her. That's a much better way to go about it than him directly committing treason in front of witnesses, which seems a little bit far-fetched. I think some more subtlety could have been used in this story. There's also this issue with Castaltin of this weird... Was it possession? Was he being fueled by his anger? Did Korn find a way to influence him? And if so, it was witnessed by members of his own church who saw him carry out an act which summoned a whole bunch of flesh hounds. How does that not automatically invalidate him as a leader of the church? How they not like you summoned your acts of violence summoned demons. You summoned demons. How is that? That seems to be an act in itself that should have invalidated him. Again, could have been done a little bit more subtly. If one of his priests, one of the other patriarchs, were so angered and influenced, driven to such feats of anger by, by Castaltin's preaching and his own kind of nudging them forward to do more and more um, sort of violent and horrific things like burning down inns full of potentially innocent people, that then he got corrupted by corn, and then this other priest came in, Castalton could have come in afterwards and gone, I shall purge this element from my church. And then he goes off, still being exiled because she, Zarina could still blame him. Look at what your insanity has borne. Look at what your teachings have driven people to do. That also preserves him. So that he's not the one directly doing these things. It allows him a, a sort of a way out of these situations. But instead, now we're faced with like, was he possessed by Korn? His rage made him currently a puppet to Korn? Why doesn't that happen again? Will it happen again? Has he turned? Anyway, it seems like a reason to kill him, maybe. He's been corrupted by chaos. A whole bunch of stuff. You could invalidate him with that. Make sure everyone was there who's witnessed his fury led to the summoning of flesh hounds. You could argue that they'd say, oh, it was her magic that drew them there. That's a valid argument, I suppose, if they were to dispute the other side of it. But it was very clearly the blood on the floor that from Castalton bashing someone's brains in. So I just think I just think he takes too much direct action to ever come back from it in the law going forward. So you you'd have to be a faction onto himself that maybe eventually turns to corn if that was maybe an original concept. I know the author here is dealing with a lot of aspects of trying to include aspects of the game, some of the mechanics they've made up for this game, and trying to get everyone in the right positions for the start of the Kiss Left campaign. I acknowledge that it's not an easy thing to do, especially in sort of a, let's call this a corporate gig that the author was given. But there are just still a few things where a bit more subtlety of Constantin would have made him a much, maybe more believable character. I just think he's unlikable, and because I just find him such a deplorable character. But that's my two cents on it. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comments below. And if you've liked the video, please do drop a like, subscribe, and maybe consider joining if you can. That would be great and a huge support to the channel. Other than that, guys, as always, a huge thank you for watching, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. All right, guys? Bye.